I'm Jeff Davis, taking you on the wine road. On today's podcast, you get to join me as I work a grape harvest. On a recent pre-dawn Friday morning, I made my way to Booker Vineyard in Russian River Valley, Sonoma County, as harvest was well underway. During the foggy yet comfortable morning, I spent time working, de-leafing the grapes as the skilled pickers steadily dumped them into the bin behind the tractor. Later, I joined the family as they and others removed sticks, grass, bugs, and other material on the sorting conveyor belt as the clusters of grapes made their way to the distemmer. It's a sticky, dirty process, but I enjoyed it. During the morning, I chatted with John and his wife, Diane Booker. A few days later, I caught up with their busy winemaker, Adam Lee. You'll get a good idea what life is like this time of year on a farm and, in Adam's case, traveling quite a bit to check up on vineyards. When I met John that morning, they had already done some harvesting on prior days and had just a little bit more to go. Uh, well, we're about uh, about three quarters of the way done with our harvest, which uh, it came on pretty fast and uh, for the first couple of weeks here. So uh, today's uh, was a relatively small amount tonnage-wise, but um, uh, it kind of gives us a breather now with the cooler weather. Um, the last 25% of the of the vineyard will be uh, picked out over the next two weeks, so it'll be a much easier and, and uh, more manageable pace. Yeah, the cooler temperature slows down the ripening process and the rising of the sugar and bricks levels. So you're kind of on hold, aren't you? Yeah, you're on hold with uh, with the chemistry and the sugars in the vineyard. You're still monitoring everything, uh, but it actually gives the uh, the fruit an opportunity to uh, to develop more flavors. Um, you know, we, we talk about the terminology or what we, we talk about hang time um, in the vineyard and, and allowing the, the fruit to uh, the flavors to mature and to develop some complexity and uh, that's a good thing that's what you really want you can't really make any adjustments to that it, you have to really wait for that and that has to happen out in the vineyard uh, you can adjust for uh, bricks for sugar you can adjust for acid uh, some of the chemistry but you can't you can't compromise on flavor you can't do any additions so so that has to be right and this cooler weather allows that process to to happen yeah you can't add complexity can you not you can't do that you haven't figured that out yet and i don't know if we would want to i mean this is this is what makes it really interesting uh business to be in uh, whether it's growing grapes or in working with wineries or uh making our own wine now um it's a year-to-year thing, and you really are very much dependent on Mother Nature, and uh, you can do a, a lot of things and be be dialed in in the vineyard and in the winery, but at the end of the day, Mother Nature has the final say on how things are going to evolve, and, and that's, that's a, it's a neat thing, and that's, that's how you, when you open a bottle of wine, you remember uh, that 2012 or 2014 or this year the 2016 vintage and you remember uh, what was going on and uh, and it gives you an insight into why the wine tastes the way it does and weather is a big part of it you were selling grapes for a long time and you've only been bottling now for a few years so are you getting more into the the wine making aspect of it uh, it's one of those. It's it's one of those things where we, we still sell the majority of our fruit to other wineries. Uh, I work with about twelve different wineries at, right now, and uh, had some great long term relationships, and and I'm looking forward to continuing those. Uh, but it's been a, a really interesting process uh, making our own wine and and learning something new every year and and developing an insight into what needs to happen in the winery, and that actually. Um, I feel over the last few years, it's helped me become a better farmer out in the vineyard because I understand more of what needs to happen in the winery when, when we're bringing in our own fruit for our own brand. So it's been a really uh, interesting uh, process of, of learning some, some new aspects of the business. I find that I get some of my best ideas and best insights into what we want to do with our wines when I'm out in the vineyard. It's much more fun for you now that you get to be a part of the process instead of just selling your grapes. Now that you're getting in your hands and getting your your mind and your your creative process going as well on in that side. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and also I can be a better uh, grower to the wineries that I sell to. I have a better understanding of what they're um, looking for, and uh, we can discuss that at that level more than than before. And it's a good thing. It's it's a it's a win win for everybody. 
and you work with a very talented winemaker, Adam Lee, who has his own brand, Siduri, and uh, has done very, very well with his brand. And explain the process, because it's not as easy as just picking the grapes and crushing them and making wine. You are very particular about what parts of the vineyard and what parts of certain blocks that you're using, and you keep them separate for a very important reason. Yeah, we, we've been working with Adam uh, since the beginning with our brand. Uh, uh, he's, he's a great teacher, especially the first few years. We were uh, somewhat new on the winemaking side. We've always had a, a vision of what we wanted to create uh, as, far as, uh, as far as wines from our vineyard, and he's been able to help guide that vision for us. And uh, he's, he's fun to work with, very insightful. And what's really neat work with Adam is that he, uh, he sources fruit from so many different vineyards. He sees vineyards from Oregon down to Santa Barbara, and that in itself allows... Uh, him to see so many different things in a short period of time within you know one growing season and and he's got a lot of good insight into what's happening in other parts of the state uh, other states and that's really valuable information that we we he can share that some of that with us and and so it's really uh, it's been a great working relationship and we're really um, really happy uh, working with him it's been a lot of fun how many different sections of the vineyard did you pick uh, today that you're keeping separate for future blending we, we picked um, three uh, one-and-a-half to two-ton lots um, out of the vineyard. In, uh, and in, Well, back up a little bit. Our vineyard is about, um, about 40 acres, and it consists of uh, 14 sections of, of Pinot Noir and, uh, and two different sections of Chardonnay. So what we do, and it's, it's, it is a lot, of, a lot of work, but we are sourcing small amounts from multiple sites in the vineyard. And uh, what we're trying to do is get a as much of a true representation of how to express the vineyard in a bottle of wine. And so we have, uh, like I said, we have 14 sites, uh, multiple rootstocks, multiple clones, uh, different elevation, different row direction. All of that adds to the, the each individual site being different, even though it's all Pinot Noir. So we're, we're doing these small lots, which is a lot of handwork, handwork to pick, uh, to bring, haul in, um, our individual costs are higher to do that. We have to keep it separate here at the winery. That takes more time and, uh, and higher costs to do that. But what it allows us to do then is to, is to taste each individual site and then decide how we want to put together our, our blends for our, our different Pinot bottlings, which we have right now currently three. I'm sure a lot of chefs can relate to what you're saying. You know, a lot of home cooks are like, yeah, I know you put a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then the end product is amazing. Absolutely. It's a, that's a great analogy with different uh, Pinot Noir clones can be viewed as, uh, as different spices that you have on your spice rack. And even though w- we, we really see how, how Pinot Noir is, is site-driven, the additional uh, nuances of different clones gives you that. It's like a cook in the kitchen with their different spices, and, and that's a really great analogy. Fun creative process. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, it's, and it's interesting too when you're uh, farming is is uh, is very science driven. Winemaking is is science driven also, but you really have to tap into your creative side, um, and that that's a big part of it because you can look at the numbers all day long, and it's gonna you know the, the chemistry is gonna say this, but then when you get to the blending, that's that's where your the the creativity comes in, and and uh, the uh, the artistic yeah. side has to take over. You know, the science has to be there, but then uh, everyone is allowed some individual creativity also. That's wine grape grower John Booker, who's very happy to have his own brand now, Booker Wines. They're well-crafted Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Managing 40 acres of vineyards is work enough, but the Bookers also own and run Booker Farms, a dairy farm that's been in the family for 50 years. As I rode from their home to the vineyard that morning with John's wife, Diane, I took the opportunity to get her side of what life is like on the family farm. But as it turns out, she hasn't been there as long as you may think. No, we, uh, we were married in 2007, so we're, we're blended. We have five children between the two of us. Did you know what you were getting yourself into? Not really. Um, I, if I had, I, I would have been super happy. I, it's, a, it's a lot more work. I didn't realize what working seven days a week means. <laughs> um, I kind of watched him do it for a couple of years, but watching someone do it and actually doing it yourself are two different yeah. things. Yeah, you can say that and you can try to understand it, but until you're actually there doing it, it's a whole different story. Huh? Um, but do you like life on the farm? I do. I do. It's it's really fun. Um, John will 
I hope he doesn't mind me saying this. John always says he likes cows better than grapes, but wine better than milk. So there's a lot of diversity here on our farm, and it's a lot of fun. A lot of a lot of families living here on the farm. Um, John and employs 14 full-time employees and their most of their families live here and uh there's always stuff going on it's it's a good sized business then isn't it it is um with the we have an organic dairy and milk just over 700 cows um every day and then uh, twice a day and then in addition to that there's about 600 young animals um and then we have 38 acres of wine grapes planted that um john and i purchase about 20 percent for our own brand and then the rest is sold to other wineries he, he sells to about 10 different wineries and you have kids too we do. We have five of them. So our three older daughters have all graduated from college, and both of our sons are in their second year and both go to the junior college. So in other words, seven days a week isn't even enough. <laughs> Something like that. Sometimes people ask us if we're ever going to make cheese, and it's like, when exactly do they think we have time to do that? So, But maybe someday, someday down the road. There's a lot of opportunities with the, the different things we're doing out here, whether it is making cheese or possibly opening a tasting room or just running the wine business or the vineyard, doing the farming, the dairy farming. There's lots of things for people to do. And on and on and on. (laughs) Yep. John's partner and wife, Diane Booker of Booker Vineyard and Booker Farm. And maybe someday, Booker Cheese Company. If you'd like to learn more about them, visit bookervineyard.net. That's B-U-C-H-E-R vineyard.net. We need to take a break, then I'll talk with their winemaker, Adam Lee, when we continue On the Wine Road. We're back On the Wine Road. I'm Jeff Davis. Now we move from the grape growers, John and Diane Booker, to the winemaker of Booker Wines, Adam Lee. He does well with his own brand, Sidori. He also does quite a bit more, as you'll hear. I said to Adam that I asked John Booker if he had a challenging year last year, as many Pinot Noir growers did, and was this year better. John said they actually did better than most last year, and this year seems to have just a little more yield. So it seems to have balanced out for him. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Last year was better than a lot of folks. It was still down quite a bit. We kind of got used to 12, 13, 14 too quickly and the yields and the size that the yields were. And all of a sudden, after three years, you think that's normal and that's not normal. They were larger crop years. Uh, 15 was down a good bit. 16, honestly, to me, looks normal, which is nice. A little unusual, but it's nice. Uh, And it's like you say, it's been a while because 11 was a bad year because it was a rainy year and some people had problems with that. And then all of a sudden 12, 13, 14 was great. So, yeah, it's been a while since you had a normal, whatever that would be, year. Uh, Actually, if I go back and look at it, 10 was small. Nine was relatively big, maybe on the high side of normal. Eight was small. Seven was too big. Six. Six might be the last normal. (laughs) That's a long time. (laughs) It is a long time. But the grapes look good over there at Booker Vineyards. Uh, Are you pretty happy with uh, what's going to be coming out of there? Yeah, actually, I think I am. Everything that came there came fairly early. That's not uncommon for Booker. The one thing that doesn't come early there is Chardonnay. Chardonnay tends to back up a little bit for some reason. It may be a rootstock clonal combination, maybe just something I don't understand. But uh, Pinot is on the earlier side for Pinot. But I think the quality this year looks to be um, very, very good. Uh, I'm reluctant to say it's amazing until the wine is made, yeah. but the quality looks to be fantastic. Last year, 15, uh, I think are going to be the best wines that we've made from Bucher in the years I've been doing it. I'm really excited. Is that, uh, I understand that Willoughby's in Santa Rosa and possibly Petaluma started carrying Bucher. Yeah. Uh, was that 15 or probably 14? That was 14, and I think the 14s were better. You know, some of it, you can talk about the vineyards and the age of the vineyards and this and that and that. It all has a factor. Uh, a part of it is also winemaker experience, be it me, um, grape grower experience, be it, be it John. Uh, you need experience. You need time to really understand this, and you only get one shot a year. I don't know if most people, depending on what they do for a living, but if you're writing loans or if you're trading stocks or whatever you're doing, each day maybe you screw up, but you get a chance to redo it the next day. 
with winemaking and grape growing, you get one year and yeah. you have to wait 12 months to redo it again. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were speaking highly of the Booker over there at Willoughby's. I was there uh, last week, and uh, they're, um, they're very excited about it. Yeah, I think the, the wines have a really distinct character. And to m- my way of thinking, that's the most important thing, is that wines are unique, distinct. They have real character to them. Booker has good fruit, good richness. But for a place that is an early ripening site, which can be sometimes just about simple fruit, that's not the case at all with Booker. This one has some earthiness, uh, a little something that makes you want to pair it with food to have it with a, a menu. I like that style of wine quite a bit. Yeah. How many other vineyards are you working with aside from your own label? Uh, so what I do for Siduri, I work with 25, 30 different vineyards from Oregon all the way down to Santa Barbara for Pinot. Um, I consult for a winery in Oregon. I consult for another winemaker in Russian River. I, I mean, I spend a lot of time out in the vineyards. And to me, that's really that's key. Wine makes itself. It's not winemakers shouldn't be saying this and let people know that it's an easy thing to do. You know, we can go to Safeway and you and I can buy grapes and we can make wine. The the keys to stop it from becoming vinegar, because that's just the natural process. Grape juice becomes wine, becomes vinegar. We need to stop it from that. To make something special, that's where you do some work. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so needless to say, you're running around quite a bit right now. I mean, we talked, uh, we've been talking since about Thursday and you went down to Santa Barbara. You came back today. You're over in Napa. We're literally meeting on the side of the road to have this conversation. Uh, It must drive you ragged, but you surely enjoy it. I love it. I, I, it is my favorite time of the year. Yeah, I spend, I mean, we were talking this morning. I, I was like, I spend a lot of time. I think I sent you an email at four or four 15 this morning. I spend a lot of time early early in the mornings going out to vineyards i get a little ragged about this time of day four o'clock in the afternoon that becomes a little more when you're up 12 13 hours that's when you start to to slow down a little bit but yeah i was in monterey in santa barbara on saturday sunday i will be in oregon on wednesday i'll be back in monterey santa barbara on friday uh, and then in Russian River Vineyards this morning and tomorrow morning. It's yeah. it's that time of the year. And you're still going back to the winery today. I am going to go back to the winery, check on ferments, make sure everything is moving along in the way it should be. You know what I love about it really is it gets tiring. I mean, I said 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I get tired. Uh, every morning I wake up excited again to do it. There is, I don't know what else I would ever do this, this time of the year, this excitement of making wine where you actually get to take something and make something new out of it. Uh, not a lot of people get to do that. A lot of people sell this for that or blah, that's made by someone else or other. I actually get to help make and, and craft something. It's really, really special. I, I love it. And no doubt not ever boring because Mother Nature always throws new challenges at you every year. So it's always different, isn't it? Yeah. The, the real key in some ways is to learn from the past and yet think of it new each year. It's a difficult dichotomy to be able to look at it and say that I need to almost forget everything I learned because this year is different. And yet if there are a few things that are similar, learn how to... Uh, incorporate those things, incorporate the lessons you learned, either do more of this or don't ever do that again, whatever the lesson might be, incorporate what you learned in the past again, and yet look at each each year as new and special. And that's what keeps winemakers doing it until they're 80, 90 years old. Adam Lee of Sidori Wines, who also makes Booker Wines. I appreciate him fitting me into his very hectic schedule. It was enjoyable to participate a little in this year's harvest with the Bukers. Next week, you'll hear me at Amista Vineyards. Overall, this should be another quality year for Sonoma County and Northern California wine producers. I'm Jeff Davis. Thanks for listening to this episode of On the Wine Road.